Like most people who grew up playing video games in the mid-2000s, I played a lot of RuneScape. It wasn't my first MMO. That was a little text-based game called Hidden World that I never quite wrapped my head around. But it was the one I sank countless hours into over the years. While I would fall off the RuneScape wagon several times, I kept coming back and generally considered myself a fan of the MMO genre. That being said, it's hard to be a fan when you haven't actually seen that much. And a while back, I realized that for as much as I enjoy MMOs, I hadn't actually played that many. So I've set out to fix that with a plan that I can only describe as an MMO vacation. Today I take the first steps, so pull up a nice chair, grab a drink, and lean back as I recount my time in Embers Adrift. Our journey starts, as so many do, with character creation. It's surprisingly in-depth compared to what I'm used to, with a nice variety of skin, eye, and hair colors, as well as several different body shapes that were kind of fun to mess around with. You can even change your character's favorite color, which was a nice touch. You have to pick a role at the start, and as a DPS main at heart, I, of course, I picked Striker. The name Bob was taken already, so I went with my fallback option. My character made, it was time to get started. I'd heard that Embers Adrift was the kind of place that you wanted to bring a friend along for, so Cat, my artist and occasional guest editor, agreed to tag along. We spawned in at a village in New Haven Valley on a bright and sunny day. With a bit of scrambling to figure out the controls, it's time to talk to the first person that we see. That ends up being Dante, a bard who seems to be some kind of siren for travelers like us, and he directs us to Rhonda. She's the guard of the village and should give us some pointers on how to survive when we're inevitably jumped by every enemy in a five-mile radius. Rhonda herself wastes no time in pointing us towards the nearby Ember Ring, a fire that burns with no fuel and seems to have some healing properties. We've got some wounds left over from getting here, though I have no memory of how. So we walk over to the ring, and naturally, I immediately set myself on fire. Once our wounds are healed, Rhonda walks us through the basics of combat. We start with two abilities, and our usual auto attack, but the cooldown timers are quite a bit longer than I'm used to. That's nothing that we can't adjust to, though, and once we've proved we can successfully hold our own against some training dummies, Rhonda hands us a couple health potions and sends us off to see Johan. He warns us about all of the dangerous fauna in the area, and tells us to kill 20 of the local forest beasts to get some experience under our belts. Now I didn't come here to not kill 10 boars, so we jump the first rabbit that we see and promptly drown in tutorial pop-ups. That's one down and 19 to go. Our next target is a doe and... Hey, I know that sound. I guess Embers Adrift and Gadonia must import their deer from the same place. Not too long later, we get a recipe book from a rabbit. I'm not sure why the rabbit had it, or what it needed some leather armor for, but I'm sure this will come in handy once we learn how to craft our own gear. Speaking of which, we should probably pick up a gathering roll. There are three options available to us from the start, and I decide to pick up Forester. I'm not sure why I picked this one, since Prospector or Hunter would probably be more useful for my class, but maybe I was just lured in by the idea of hoovering up every stray plant that isn't nailed down. After a quick break to try out our new gathering classes, in which I actually found nothing that I can gather, we get back to hunting down forest critters. Our first level up comes after fighting a bear, which earns us a bit more health and a new ability that uses a consumable as fuel. Fortunately, the enemies in the area drop the item 12 or 13 at a time, so I never felt like I was going to run out even using this ability as much as I could. We kill our 19th enemy and get jumped by a smuggler as soon as the fight ends. We're a bit overleveled for them, but there was still that brief moment of confusion when they caught us off guard. We made quick work of them, though, and, and we were able to head back to Johan after one last quill back. Once we report back to Johan, we're set free to explore the land and do whatever we feel like. He tells us that the large blue planet we can see hanging in the sky is true north, so we'll always have some idea of where we are. Personally, I think that's very accommodating for travelers like me, since I do have a tendency to wander off when people aren't paying attention. Johan also points us in the direction of two people in the valley that could use some help. Just like that, we're set loose on New Haven Valley. This is where things get pretty interesting for me. I've always preferred a nice theme park style MMO to a sandbox, 
but I came here to experience a new way of doing things, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I do still need to find some logs for the Forester tutorial quest, so I decided to spend some time doing that. Of course, night had fallen, so this might not be the best time to look, but that's never stopped me before. However, running around in the dark isn't the best idea, as you might imagine, and before long I get jumped by another smuggler. This one is quite a bit stronger than the other one, but it's nothing that a liberal application of swords can't handle. After several more minutes of searching, we manage to track down a log, and I can finally continue with the intro quest. We're allowed to pick up a second crafting or gathering class once we reach level 6 of our current one, so I've got quite a ways to go before I can even think of doing that. One of the many deer that we killed along the way dropped a new axe, so I decide to give it a try. Each roll can equip a few different weapons that change how it feels to play, so you know what? Why not see how swinging a large axe changes things up versus the twin swords that I started with? Unfortunately, while I'm testing it out, we have a fight interrupted by a guard. Not only was this incredibly rude of him, we also don't get any experience or credit towards quests that we're working on. Guards patrol the main roads night and day, so we'll need to be careful if we're working on any Kill X quests near the road. Continuing on down the road to the next town, we run into Balgar, one of the two people that Johan pointed us to. He sent his apprentice off to study an ember pillar somewhere in the east part of the valley, and he's concerned because that apprentice never returned. This sounds exactly like the kind of thing that we're here to check out, but we're going to poke around town to see what else we can find. One of those things is a billboard where we can pick up repeatable quests. For now, it only holds kill quests in the local area, but I'm pretty sure some crafting and gathering ones will start getting posted eventually. I'm sure it's a nice way to find enemies to fight when you're just looking to grind some combat. Fortunately, that's exactly what I'm looking to do, so I pick up a quest to kill 20 more animals that I can work on while we're looking for Balgar's apprentice. Leaving town, we find something strange. There's a clump of trees with a thick layer of mist hanging around it, and when I approach, the color gets really washed out. I have no idea what this is, so if anybody knows, I'd love to hear about it. And of course, we get jumped by another smuggler while we're looking at it. The valley seems to have a real bandit problem. Maybe that's something we'll be able to help with. Balgar told us the Ember Pillar was on the east part of the valley, and our wanderings in that vague direction bring us to a tower, where we find Gildan the Cartographer. I refuse to let the voices win and just ask the man about the map he's working on. He's actually having some trouble finishing it, so we offer to help out by finding every area in the valley. We also run into Halleck, a ranger who wants us to deliver a poem to his friend Theron. It's a bit of a strange request, but between the map quest and looking for the Ember Pillar, we'll be heading off that way regardless. While we're off exploring, I notice something strange in the distance. There's a figure out there that looks like a person, except their face is glowing the same color as the Ember Rings. Never being one to shy away from a mystery, never mind the risk of instant death, I start running towards the figure. Just as we're getting close enough to realize how much taller than us it is, it casts some sort of teleport spell and vanishes. I'm beginning to think there's more going on here than we know, but that sounds more of a long-term resident problem, and we're just here for a visit. The next day, we bite off a bit more than we can chew with a shoat that's above our level. It's a simple mistake anyone could have made, I promise. Once it becomes abundantly clear that I can't beat this thing, I try running it to one of the guards. Unfortunately, I chose Jeremy Buds, who, while being labeled as a guard, is probably actually a quest NPC, and doesn't seem particularly bothered that an angry pig is murdering someone in front of him. Thanks, Jeremy. Running back towards the Ember Ring, I catch the attention of an actual guard, though the show is faster and nearly downs me. Two players notice what's going on, and they team up with the guard to save me. One of them even heals me afterwards, which was quite nice of them. With everything settled, I go back to pick Cat up, naturally setting myself on fire in the process, right in front of the player who just healed me, because this is still me we're talking about. Still not having learned our lesson, we pick another bad fight, and Cat exits stage left, pursued by a bear. This time we manage to hit the aggro range before anyone goes down, so everyone walks away more or less unscathed. Now that I've got some combat experience under my belt, I consider changing roles. The striker role has been fine, but it isn't really what I've been hoping for. Each of the roles is sold by a trainer, but 
if you can change your character's role, it looks like it resets you to level one. That makes sense for how the rest of the mechanics have worked, but I don't feel like grinding up another class right now. If I were to play this game again, I'll likely start a new character as a support role to help out more in combat. Though, with the intention of classing into Duelist when the time comes, because I still do like doing damage. Since I'm not doing that, though, it's back to the grind with Striker. Having finished my first billboard quest, I pick up another one to kill 15 mandrakes, so I spend some time working on that. There's not much that they can do to me at this point, so it's just a matter of hitting my buttons in something close to the right order. Or at least it is right up until the time two thieves and another mandrake join the fight. I have no idea what I did to make these bandits think I have anything worth stealing, but it quickly turns into way more than I can deal with. I managed to break away and find a guard, which was a bit of a lucky break, even if it means that second mandrake doesn't mean anything for my quest. I suspect what's going on here is that there are a few different types of enemies in this area that can spawn in aggressive towards the players, and the game rolls dice periodically to see if one of them is going to spawn in and bull rush you. Either that, or the native New Haveners are just really rude and enjoy griefing new players. I'm not sure which. Either is a possibility. A lot of off-screen plant hunting finally gets my forester to level 6, which means it's time for me to pick up a crafting role. While my role doesn't really use wooden weapons aside from bows, I choose woodworker since that should pair pretty well with forester. Might not be the best choice overall, but at least it'll let me try out the crafting system. Not too far away, one of the guards has a bit of a problem that he wants some help with. I'd agree to do it. For a price, and he tells me that a shipment of weapons he was in charge of has gone missing. The only person who might have had something to do with it was a lady that he saw standing on the edge of town shortly before the weapons disappeared. Apparently, she ran off towards the east, which means that is now three quests we need to head in that direction for. Unfortunately for the guard, we never did actually figure out where the weapons went. I'm sure everything turned out just fine with that, though. Continuing the running theme of knights just being the time for saying, nope, I'm not dealing with that, we find a tree monster that's stomping and thwomping its way through the forest. I don't see a name in a chevron, but I'm not taking any chances with that thing. After that, we kind of settle into a groove of fighting bears and stopping to gather plants when we find them. It's surprisingly easy here to disappear into the rhythm of combat and gathering. Eventually, we wander our way over to Theron's camp. Theron tells us how there was once a dangerous bear that stalked the valley. He and Halleck tried to track and kill the beast, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. We could try to bait the creature out by killing its offspring, but we definitely don't have enough people for that. Just south of Theron's camp, we find the Ember Pillar, though there's no sign of his apprentice. The pillar looks like a burned-out tree glowing with the same color as the Ember Rings, and also the same color as the large figure in the tree monster. It feels like there's something building here in the details, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't curious to know what it's all leading to. With no sign of the apprentice, though, we check out the nearby smuggler camp. Maybe we can figure out why they keep attacking us out of nowhere. The camp is predictably drowning in smugglers, far too many for the two of us to handle by ourselves, and we have to tuck ourselves away in a corner where it at least doesn't look like they can get to us. Unfortunately, they can get close enough to aggro, and I really should have run away when I had the chance. I did figure things out eventually, though, when another smuggler came by and somehow both couldn't reach me and was repeatedly landing critical hits. After spending quite a while working on our gathering classes, we decide it's time to check out the main city of New Haven. The place has a large market, and it's also where we can specialize into our class when the time comes but the market mostly seems to sell recipes for crafted gear and not so much of the gear itself, so it's not much use to us. Once we've explored the city to our satisfaction, we head back to Balgar and tell him about his apprentice. He recognizes the camp as being built around an abandoned mine and begs us to gather some people to go back in there and save his apprentice. Oh, and also the mine was abandoned because of a serious spider problem. That last bit poses something of an issue, as half of our group has severe arachnophobia. The other option, aside from doing it ourselves, seems to be to get the guard involved. I choose to go myself, having more or less written off finishing the quest for now, while Kat decides to go with the guard option. 
I'm curious to see the difference between the two. We do still have that map quest to work on, so we head to the northwestern part of the valley to see what we can find. It turns out the place is called Bear Country, which I'm pretty sure should just be the name of the whole valley. Near the local ember ring, we find something I can only describe as a very ominous pot. It has the same color drain effect near it, and based on the sides, it seems to be full of the same thing that the ember rings are burning. Not too long later, we find a large pile of smugglers standing just outside a tunnel. There's also a chest nearby that's being guarded by a horde of rats. They'll probably attack us as soon as we try to open it, but the call of free stuff is just too much to bear. Right, definitely too many rats. I did notice I respawned near one of the ominous things, but I'm not sure if that's random coincidence and or if those are respawn points. After getting our stuff back, we take a second shot at opening the box. There are fewer rats this time, as we were able to knock out a few on our first attempt, and by peeling the remainder off one at a time with my bow, we're able to take them out. The box contains a few odds and ends, including quite a bit of armor that's better than what we're currently wearing. So, all things considered, I'd say it was worth it in the end. The fight did leave us both with some wounds that we'll need to heal, so we plop ourselves down just outside the ember ring and kick back until that goes away. It takes a bit, but once those are healed, we set back out into the wilds. Continuing one of the running themes of our trip, we get jumped by a bear that's both higher level than us and also meant for a party of six to eight people. We're able to get away from the thing that will join the ever-increasing lineup of things that haunt my dreams, but not before we get a taste of exactly why it takes so many people to fight. A bit more exploring leads us to a cave full of bears. I'm pretty sure this is where Theron and Halleck wanted us to go, but seeing as two is still a smaller number than six, there's nothing we can do here. While we're exploring, I happen to notice a biker mice from Mars joke in chat, which is a wild thing to see at all, but especially here in 2024. Passing by the smuggler tunnel from earlier, the place seems to be abandoned. Or, more specifically, someone seems to be hunting them to extinction. It's been a while since we've been attacked by them, so while I'm pretty sure that had nothing to do with it, I can't be 100% sure. With the northwestern region mostly explored, we get back to trying to save Balgar's apprentice. The guard would love to help, but they're too swamped with all the thefts in the valley. In fact, they've been asked to look into Phil the Miller's missing grain before the guards will help with the missing apprentice. Speaking to Phil, he suspects the local bandits have been taking it, and he wants us to get it back. The closest place we can think to investigate was that tunnel that was until so recently full of smugglers. So, off we go. Fortunately for us, the player who was hunting smugglers earlier is still at it, so we have no issues walking right up to the door of the tunnel. Coincidentally, that was also the last area we needed for the map quest, so we can mark that one off the list as well. Through the door is the Central Veins dungeon, and now we get to see what a dungeon in Embers Adrift looks like. This also highlights something that I find pretty interesting, in that no matter which path you choose in the quest, you end up in this dungeon for more or less the same reason. That kind of branching quest design is neat to see, even if it does mean that there's a non-zero risk of spiders in the near future. On loading into the dungeon, we meet Damok and Borlak, two adventurers who are slowly trying to work their way through the dungeon. I guess they're having some trouble, since they're huddling around the Ember Ring to heal up. I scout ahead to make sure things are safe, and one of the enemies spawns in behind me. It's below our level, so nothing we can't handle, though I do have to wonder what's going on with my character's neck. That looks painful. A bit deeper in the dungeon, we run across those two adventurers again. They've drawn the aggro of an enemy that's too tough for the two of them alone to fight, so we jump in and help. Fighting with a group like this is easily the most fun that I had in the game, and we tag along with them for quite a bit of the rest of the dungeon. Having this many people involved really helps with both the big enemies and the groups that normally give us trouble. This was the moment where the game really came alive for me, and if I ever find myself back in New Haven Valley, I'll be sure to bring a few more people along. The good times, unfortunately, couldn't last forever. 
As Balgar had hinted, we rounded a corner and ran into a surprise spider, and that was that. I doubt they'll ever see this, but in case Borlack or Damok are watching, it was a lot of fun running through the dungeon with you, and I wish you the best of luck on your future bag runs. And that's where our time in Embers Adrift came to an end, as we hit the end of the free trial. I had been a bit nervous going in, as someone who had little experience with sandbox MMOs, but after all of this, I think I can start to see the appeal. The free trial gave me a taste of what to expect from the game, and well, not everything really clicked for me, a lot of it did. I don't know if I'll ever come back to Embers Adrift, but I'll always remember the time I did spend here fondly. And you better believe that when that day comes, I'll still be accidentally stepping in the Ember Rings every time. Anyways, that's all the time we have for today. If there's an MMO you want to see, be sure to drop the recommendation down in the comments, and keep an eye out for the upcoming poll. I'll be using it to determine the order I tackle the next couple games in. Thank you once again for watching, I hope you had as much fun with this one as I did making it, and I'll catch you in the next one.